Hey folks, welcome back to November Day 12. This one was Monument, and rather than a time lapse, I'm going to be just doing this one directly as a screen recording after the fact, because it took me so long to actually work out what I was doing with all of my rendering and compositor nodes and just all of that sort of stuff. So I thought just easier to look back on it rather than following along with the process. So this is the final result, and I was really trying to get something that looked really sketchy had some nice variation in line weight, in shapes, had a little bit of control over what is highlighted and what has these like really dark areas, and adding a little bit of this hatching texture in as well. How is this actually made? Let's go back to just the geometry nodes set up because the whole scene is procedural as well. I've essentially just taken a whole bunch of primitives, which we can see here. See a bunch of cubes with a bit of shear on them, a spline going down the middle there, and then a sphere at the end, literally just blocking in as simply as possible. Instance a bunch of icospheres on top of that, mesh to grid, grid to mesh. On the other end, just to send that to a big remeshed thing. The clouds, this was just a stack of, here we go, a stack of arc shapes, which I turned into a mesh, deleted random points, turned back into a curve, so now I've got gaps. Did a curve to mesh with a profile that was randomly scaled based on some noise and then literally just melted it instance on the surface and then melted them all together. So that was it for the clouds, nothing special. So really, really basic geometry, nothing that fancy, but the magic comes with the compositor setup. So let's have a click through that. So the final look here is fairly advanced and it looks kind of wild that we get to that with essentially no shaders, but let's walk through the logic here. So I wanna just highlight this section to begin with, just so that you understand what's going on here. I have my distance into the scene, which I've denoised and then normalized. So I'm getting like a zero to one value depth wise into the scene. And I have added a bit of deformation onto here. And this deform group is essentially just adding some Voronoi to the surface. So if we tab into here, so this is the, it's gonna be a bit difficult to see without the normalize, but essentially, so we're just scaling the image based on some Voronoi texture and it gives us a little bit of a broken look, a little bit more painterly, basically. I'm not sure it has much of an impact on the scene, but just so you know what's happening, that is what's going on in the deform group. And I made it into a group because I'm using it in a bunch of different places, just so that our base image is always affected exactly the same way. So I've got my distance gradient and I'm using a map range here just to basically isolate the front and the rear because in the final composition, I wanted this zone, which we can see in the foreground, the black to be rendered slightly differently from the stuff at the back. So you can see that I've got these mixed nodes just swapping a few different values in between them. So that's all that is doing. It looks a bit complicated and we've got all these additional noodles, but all this is doing is changing the values between the front and the back sections. So most of the effect, most of the look is happening in this lower frame here. So let's just work through this. So we're taking our scene depth, which looks like this. We're taking our position. And again, it's all just running through this deform group. So this is essentially the world space position of each of the rendered surface points. And we also have the surface normals from all of our geometry. So you can see that looks pretty much as we would expect. So the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take our position value into a noise texture. And that looks something like this. Now, there is an additional bit of logic here to scale all of this based on the depth into the scene. Because as you can imagine, if we're working completely off the scene position for our vector into the noise, everything which is up close is going to be bigger than everything further away, obviously, because this is based on the uh, the distance from the camera. Things get further away, they get smaller. What I wanted it to do was look as if it was all the same size because it needed to look as if it had all been painted by somebody who was looking at a piece of paper, so a 2D interpretation. So all of the, the decisions about curvature and line thickness and things like this all need to be done from the point of view of a 2D image rather than going into 3D space. So we have a little bit of logic here where we're just dividing our scale value, which is what this multiply is, by the depth into the scene. And that allows us to make sure that our foreground and, and distant land have approximately the same scale on that noise texture. I had some issues. Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna be particularly visible in here, but there is, a, there is some striping that you notice up close um, when you start putting filters on these. You can see it a little bit here. So it looks like a bit depth issue, um, but I'm just gonna use this blur node to get rid of any of that. And we've got quite a high blur on here just to get rid of any of those steppings. The next thing to do, because I want to be working with Voronoi is to create some coordinates for that. 
So I'm using, it looks like I'm rendering the scene here, but all I'm actually using that for is the image coordinates. And I could take that from any other socket. It doesn't have to be the image one here. Um, so this image coordinates node uniform, this is going to give us just a starting at zero and then increasing away from the center. So I'm taking my coordinate space and I'm doing a linear light by the noise texture. And what that allows us to do is to push. I've talked about this in a lot of different tutorials before, but essentially linear light will add anything above 0 0.5 and subtract it below 0 0.5. So when we add our noise texture into this, we're essentially distorting all of these coordinates, which when we then use those on the Voronoi gives us a really nicely distorted Voronoi. So these are our coordinates. You can see that they've all been mangled, but you can see all of the spatial stuff from our depth. Put this into the Voronoi coordinates, and now we have a distorted Voronoi that follows, well, it, it's sort of in screen space because we're using these image coordinates, but it's also being distorted as it goes into the scene. So it's a bit of a mix of both things. Then we're taking the distance from this distance to edge into a subtract, and this is where we're using our normal from the scene. So I've got my normal against the vector 0, 1, 1. So that is forwards in the y-axis and up in the z-axis. Uh, so you can see that we've cast in some of these dark shadows against geometry that points towards us, manipulating the value and then subtracting it from that Voronoi texture. And that allows us to block in some of these areas where we want a little bit more clarity, a little bit more peace, a bit more resting. So that's on the upward facing stuff. It just looks a little bit smoother. So our shadows are going to be where all of the detailed line work is. And then comes the filters. This is basically where the magic happens. So this obviously looks rubbish at this point. But if we take a Kuahara, which is going to essentially take patches and make them all similar within some radius. So you can see when we do this, it's going to make it look a little bit more blotchy. So there we go. It doesn't make such a big impact on the foreground where it's up close. But if we zoom in on any of these, you can see that we're beginning to get something here, some interesting shapes. And then what we can do is we can put this through a filter, which I'm using a Sobol. Uh, the Sobol filter is essentially like an edge detection. So you can see that we now have anywhere that is detected edges, we have like really high, really hot highlights. And then anywhere that we had big spaces of similar, it's just left it black. Next up, we are going to sharpen this. I'm using a diamond sharpen. And you don't see the factors on these and they're normally zero to one. But with a lot of these filters, I've cranked them up much higher than they are designed in, in inverted commas. Uh, so I think these might be at a factor of three or five or maybe even higher than that. The point here is that I just really wanted to break things. But you can now see that we're really pulling out some of these highlights and it's created a huge amount of definition with that diamond sharpen. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take another Kuahara. And when you're doing a workflow like this, it's super dependent on your resolution. It's very dependent on any textures that you've got, the scale of textures, the type of geometry that you're using. So this series of filters is probably not going to look good for you out of the box. It took me a long time, and I mean multiple, multiple hours for me to find something that I was really happy with, just bouncing back and forth, trying different values. So this is already looking a lot better. We've got a lot more smoothness on these edges than just with the diamond sharpen. It's blown out some of the ones which were just a bit a bit small. Um, and we're starting to get some really interesting shapes happening. So the next thing to do is pass this through a map range. And I'm just using a very small difference in between the from min and the from max to sort of threshold it. But I don't want to threshold it with a greater than because that would give me a really hard edge. And you don't ever, ever want completely sharp edges because your pixels are going to look really ugly. It's going to take a bit of work for you to then fix that. So you can see in this foreground where we have our threshold set, we're getting completely white sections with some smaller passages in between. And then here, where we were using our, do you remember we used our dot product to blow out some of this upward facing surface? You can see it's much less impactful. And then we've got the increased shadow areas up this hill. And you can see in the distance some of the indications of Foranoi as we're sort of coming around here. So it's not completely obliterated all of the original information. But it's just a nice way to follow all of the geometry. The next thing we're going to do here is we're going to add something. But let's have a look at what that something is. So this is going to be our, um, our hatching texture. So we're going to take our 
image coordinates and we are going to rotate them based on essentially a random value from our Voronoi and this Voronoi and this Voronoi they are set up exactly the same so they have the same scale and the same coordinates you can think of them as being identical one is doing the distance to edge output and the other one is doing the color output so we just have colored cells that follow the exact same layout as our Voronoi did before so all of these. So we're just taking uh, the x coordinate, multiplying it by 2 times pi. So now we have just essentially a random 0 to 1 value. Multiply by 2 pi, that's our 360 degrees. So we're doing a random rotation of our coordinate space in all directions. So it will go up to a full rotation. Each of these cells is being rotated differently. We're plugging this into a wave texture. So essentially we have a wave texture which is facing the screen because it's in screen space coordinates and it's just pointing in different directions based on where it lands but you can see that all of these lines are essentially the same spacing between each other they're no different just because they're further into the scene or anything like that and this is another important illusion from uh, imagining that this has been drawn by somebody on a piece of paper so we're taking all these lines we're going to take another one of our random values as a mask so now we're going to get rid of some of the cells because we don't want hatching everywhere. We just want it on some parts. doesn't really matter which ones in our case. So now we've masked this out to just being in the foreground. And again, this is taking values in from further up that section that I was talking about before. So distance based. Doing a smooth minimum against our distance to edge. And then we're just manipulating these values with another map range just to give that extra control. And there we go. That's looking a bit sharper. This is what we are adding to the rest of our line work like this so it's all starting to come together now we're going to anti-alias it there's an anti-aliasing node if you're doing this kind of stuff with hard filters and like we're going we're taking these filters far harder than they should be used especially the the uh, like the diamond sharpen so you are going to want to anti-alias this and then just to clean some things up because i didn't want anything in the sky we're also doing a multiply by anywhere that's greater than our normalized scene distance so anything which is essentially beyond the back of these clouds is going to just be replaced with black so there we go so this is just now isolated it down to the main section the next thing for us to do is going to be to color these lines so with this we've got two things going on we have our scene depth normalized there we go and we also have our mask for our monument and this just came through a shader aov so i'm taking my depth normalizing it setting a map range so I can get rid of those clouds and then deforming it just to make sure that everything follows the same layout. You can see it's shrunk some of that down, it's blurred some of it. It's very simple but and probably not very important for this setup. And then what I also did was I took that monument mask and I expanded it and then I uh, just used it to mix in a little bit of the same color that we're using for the background. Essentially this monument the way that all of the lines have happened with between the Sobol and the uh, the diamond sharpening, as well as the Kuwahara, everything's kind of drifted. It's not exactly where the geometry was. So I just need to make sure that I'm allowing for this to cover the rest of my lines. So then we can come into our color ramp here. And this is just defining the color of the lines as we come into the scene. So I've got black in the foreground, going through ready purple up to a nice sort of desaturated blue pink in the background. And then we're just using this through a mix. So now you can see that we have our main white background and our lightly colored lines. And I really like these ones in the distance. Just feels so minimal on these, these sort of sea spires and around the clouds here. Just really nice. And you alias that. And then we're going to add some paper. So first of all, let's make a texture. This is just a very high detail. So seven levels of detail. 18 on the scale and a roughness of one. So you can see... Oh, and it's got a bit of distortion as well. So as we increase that roughness, it essentially reduces the contrast until we get a nice, soft, uh, not completely like white noise. Like it's not just noise. We want this to have some level of looking like it's patchy, like paper is. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply this in. So we're just going to add a little bit of darkness to it just to give us a little bit more control. And then separately, we're going to add some of the really high spots just anywhere that's a bit lighter. So you can see this is our general paper texture. These are our highlights. We're going to multiply in the general texture and then we're going to add over everything 
these high spots and it's going to look a little bit faded just for a little bit of additional grit we've added some sensor noise at the end and there we go so now if we look at the render you can see where we've added that paper texture so multiplied into the background which is why it looks a little bit darker and then added to put it over the top of these sections of ink and it just makes it look a little bit more brushed doesn't it you know like when you're working with something like india ink or china ink you get areas that are a bit thicker a little bit darker and you get areas where it's soaked in a little bit better and perhaps being a little bit watery but you get some really lovely brushy marks you see a little bit of that voronoi texture in there see some of these hatching marks on this this sort of boulder in the foreground this tree just kind of got obliterated a little bit too much perhaps so you can see in the background it's quite faint quite minimal line work whereas in the foreground we've got quite heavy marks so uh, this is why we had that first section where we were splitting off the foreground and the background controls just because we wanted the foreground to have a little bit more heavy line work to separate it from the background on top of the additional use of the color to fade out those cloud lines but there we go that is how we made this effect for monument hope you learned something hope you had fun and i'll catch you in the next one